Hey, welcome to Talk Gnosis. I'm your host, Deacon Sean. And today we're talking to uh, Natanella Elias. Did I say it right? Yes, you did. Yeah. <laughs> Who, who's going to be discussing well, her... Oh, thank you. Uh, discussing her fascinating book, The, the Gnostic Paradigm. I, I think this is a, a really cool book, a really interesting book. I, I think it's a really important book that, that hasn't gotten enough notice. So I'm, I'm going to be really excited uh, to, to discuss it. Uh, before we, we get to it, uh, I have to do the commercial for our Patreon. Uh, you know, we always start with a little bit of pain before we get to the pleasure. It makes everything else so much more enjoyable. Uh, that is patreon.com slash Gnostic. For as little as a dollar per month, you can help us keep the show going. What do you get for that dollar uh, or more? Um, you uh, get early access to the shows. Uh, we're going to try to think of more things to give to our patrons. Uh, patrons, you can message me and say, I want this or why don't you do this? We don't want to put extra shows behind a paywall, though, which is what a lot of people do on Patreon because we want to spread the light of Gnosis. Uh, we have been getting some, some sign-ups and some generous one-time donations. So all those people who have given us those very generous one-time donations, thank you so much. What we're going to do with that money is we're hoping, we're trying, we are doing more shows per month. Uh, Jason, who's our co-host, uh, who couldn't be here today, uh, he's going to start a whole new show. So lots more programming coming down the, the wire uh, thanks to people's financial support. You can do those one-time donations at paypal.me slash Gnostic. And of course, uh, you can help us out in other ways if you're unable to do it financially, because I understand. Uh, I, there's lots of podcasts I listen to that I don't give money to, although there's a lot that I do. Okay, so you can also like and subscribe, tell people about the show, take your favorite episode, just email it to a friend. You know, uh, mouth to ear is still very powerful. Uh, liking and subscribing, giving us good reviews on, on iTunes or Apple Podcasts or the podcast catcher of your choice. All this stuff really helps the show. Uh, okay, so that is over. We are going to dive in here. So I, I, I think a lot of people are going to be kind of surprised about the topic, the era, the time, and the works that we're discussing. Because we're often discussing the, the second century on this show, or we're talking about, you know, Gnosticism within the last 100 years. So, and often in the Middle East, or the Mediterranean, or North America. So a lot of people associate Gnosticism, uh, ancient Gnosticism, with places like Mediterranean Europe, with Syria, with Egypt, with the, the first couple Christian centuries. But, but what is the Gnostic paradigm? And what does it have to do with the literature of the late medieval period in England? Okay, well, that is a very good question, and uh, one that has been asked over and over <laughs> by many different people from uh, many different fields. Um, and as I've always claimed and still do, even more so today than, uh, than in the past, um, even though that by the later 14th century, which is the century that I'm dealing with uh, in this specific book, uh, Gnosticism, as, um, as you all know it, uh, the second century religion, its influences, um, they all seem to have completely dispersed, at least on the surface. Um, certainly, the late medieval church was uh, vigorous in its efforts to teach orthodoxy uh, to the lady and, and uh, veer as much away as possible from uh, such heresies, uh, which, as I will discuss later, was actually a very central and very important one uh, at the very beginning of the formation of the canonical Catholic Church. Um, yet there's a sense of simmering continuation that I deal with throughout my entire book, uh, an outright reemergence, as I dare say, um, that has figured in a number of studies of late medieval literature, and in particular in English late medieval literature. Now, to be clear, and as I have made it very clear, hopefully, in the book itself, uh, Gnosticism with a capital G is the broad term that refers to this historical phenomenon, this uh, religious, generally dualistic movement uh, that indeed existed approximately between the first and fourth centuries. Um, and formally, this phenomenon was indeed abolished by the Orthodox Church as early as the fourth century. Um, nevertheless, many scholars, among them myself, uh, claim that certain Gnostic elements remained a part of Christianity, um, and in some forms, uh, in some forms that are judged uh, to be Orthodox, and in some forms that are judged to be heretical. So, in the second to the fourth century, during the very critical 
formation of of uh, of the Catholic Church annihilating such immediate threats to its stability was uh, was clearly paramount, since Gnosticism, as I said, was one of the most influential traditions at the time. Um, it also became one of the forming church's central threats. So um, in the 14th century, Gnosticism, as I just described it, as you all know it, may have no longer existed as the historical religious movement, but I argue that its influences and residues are very, very clear and very much there. Uh, and those residues, uh, a number of key repeating elements, repeating principles that come up in the literature uh, of the period uh, are what I termed the Gnostic paradigm. Um, and I'll elaborate on that a little bit further on. Yeah. Um, I mean, you kind of answered the, this question uh, just now, but, but I was wondering if you could elaborate on it. And I know it's not the focus of your book, but and I know this can't be answered definitively, right? Unless we get that time machine. But but how do you think Gnostic thought got over to Britain and, and got into these texts? So is there some sort of kind of direct continuity of ancient Gnostic thought or are these heretical spiritual ideas kind of recreated because these themes are sort of hiding out in the church, in the literature and rediscovered and recombined with the, the creativity of the authors? Or, or what? How, how do you kind of see or, or figure or guess or have theories about Gnosticism arriving here in England and getting into these texts? Well, again, a very good question and uh, something that indeed we cannot possibly uh, answer, at least not in certainty. But we do assume that it was possible through either trade, uh, religious envoys coming from the East, adventure seekers, travelers, whatnot. Uh, a very good example of this is actually the Cathars. Um, who appeared in the West around the 12th century, so we're getting closer to our period at hand, uh, in the areas of uh, southern France, Lombardy, um, and um, uh, a scholar named Bernard Hamilton um, has claimed that although they've been there, they may have been there much earlier, uh, it was during the next six years that they formed congregations throughout, throughout uh, much of Western Europe. And by the first half of the 12th century, uh, they were actually wandering preachers of heresy who were able to reach many thousands of ordinary people and uh, convert them to these new ways of thinking, uh, which weren't all that new, obviously. Um, so that is another possibility. Um, and according to other scholars and myself, they were the most serious and widespread of all the heretical movements, which basically challenged the Catholic Church in the 12th century and later on. Um, and it became a movement with a coherent body of belief, uh, with an organization that made it into a kind, into a kind of counter church, which is very, very threatening, as you can imagine. Um, so while they used Christian terminology and based their faith on the New Testament, they were clearly Christian dualists who interpreted the gospel accordingly. And their ideas were influenced by, for instance, the Bulgarian Bogomils, uh, who themselves had their roots in ancient Gnosticism. So you have a lot of these traditions, a lot of these streams springing up from, uh, uh, from supposedly from uh, the ancient Gnostic tradition and uh, transforming into different streams of ideas and I, ironically enough at some point uh the the christians themselves did not realize that they were different i mean the christian gnostics they saw themselves as as christians as uh you know as everybody else but all of a sudden they discovered that they were wrong <laughs> they were different and categorized classified immediately as uh, as heretics um, so, um, so that was a big problem, a big issue um, uh, in this period. And I, so in other words, yes, uh, to answer your question, I do see a continuity of ideas recreated and reformulated um, in the creative works of um, intellectual and uh, educated authors of the time, uh, who was the primary audience, um, uh, to be honest, of, of these kinds of works. And uh, they had some of the benefit of the doubt. They, they could fall under the radar, so to speak, and escape uh, uh, censorship precisely because they were writers. 
Uh, so under the guise of, oh, these are so-called works of fiction, you can interpret them any way you want. So if you interpret it that way, that is your problem, <laughs> right? I didn't say anything. <laughs> So it's, um, um, yeah, so uh, th that was a, a key factor in that, I think. Um, yeah. So you, to make it explicit, uh, and I'm sure people have picked up, you know, your book is about the late medieval period in England, the literature of that period. And again, even though I think you've just made a, a very compelling argument for, for how Gnosticism gets there, how we can find it. But, but I don't think a lot of people read these texts. A lot of scholars are, are thinking about Gnosticism. I don't think there's a huge body of literature, even though you, you mentioned there are other scholars that see it. So what inspired you to make the connection to Gnosticism when, when reading these texts? when studying them, when doing your academic work on them? Like, how did you discover the Gnostic paradigm? Well, at first it actually came up as, um, as the idea, it, it actually came out of a, a work, an article I wrote about Pierce Plowman. And um, it really had nothing to do with Gnosticism in the beginning. Um, it was about an uncovered scheme of reversals uh, that I will discuss uh, more at length um, a little bit later uh, that places Pierce, who is the protagonist of, of this work, uh, in a traditionally demonic position. Now, he's mostly, more often than not, he was not perceived as a, de as a demonic figure, quite the opposite. Um, and um, as I started exploring this notion of reversals uh, and what it meant to be presented as demonic in, in so-called orthodox terms, uh, it gave rise to an exploration of all sorts of ancient heresies, uh, which eventually led me to Gnosticism. It was also the question, um, the nagging question, that um, these traditions seemed to be there and quite prolific, as I just stated, uh, in previous centuries, all over Europe, all over the world, and all of a sudden something happens and they completely disappear in the late Middle Ages and they reappear in the 16th century. So what happened? So that was another very important question that I had uh, that led me to think that maybe something happened there that caused them to go undercover, so to speak. Um, so this is what led me um, to, to this exploration in particular. Yeah. Uh, we talk a lot on the show about the connection between art, literature, and Gnosticism, and, and I've really come to see how Gnosticism is carried forward through literature and art, and you know that's that's one of the continuities we have with these these ancient traditions. And I think your book is, is very important for illustrating il illustrating that, uh, and it's uh, really really quite profound. But um, uh, can you tell us about about passing, which is an important concept in your book? What what is passing? Okay, so passing, um, I identify this as a process, um, uh, the process of, of and requirements of achieving Gnosis. Um, now, the notion of passing, I call it specifically passing because um, it has been appropriated by theorists across genres and across various fields of study, and it always possesses a sense of, of pretending of deception, of uh, um, a sense that you're becoming something that you're not, and yet you are. So uh, the pastor partakes in that which he's not, so-called, mm. not. Uh, what do I mean by that? Um, uh, that which, he's, which he is not is supposedly the dominant center. And thus, by doing so, by passing, he's actually subverting the dominant ideological systems and forces. So um, I discuss a particular type of passing. You usually have that idea of passing um, in literature of, of, about uh, black characters. Black characters passing as white in a white society where white society is the dominant center and they look white and yet they're not quite according to society standards, so they have to pass. So there's a sense of deception and there's a lot going on in that um, um, in that term. But I'm not gonna go into that specifically. Uh, what I discuss is, is this passing into knowledge um, in a uniquely structured and thematized scene uh, from a state of ignorance to a regaining of knowledge uh, via required state of passivity. And here I'm already going into what I define as the Gnostic paradigm. 
um, uh, which is this process by which these features appear in the literary works. Um, for instance, uh, we have a liminal space. We have a space of in-between that is very important, uh, presented specifically in these literary works by the dream vision. Um, which is a um, very interesting and very popular genre in the late Middle Ages, um, where the passivity of the candidate actually serves as a prerequisite for beginning the process, in order to begin the process. So that's another interesting facet. Uh, you also have wise, feminine, guide-like teacher figures uh, who are supposed to lead the passer, who are supposed to lead the dreamer um, um, on this path for its self-knowledge. Uh, and then, of course, you have a soul journey, uh, which finally, hopefully, culminates in knowledge. Um, so I discuss this intermingling of concepts, uh, constantly interchanging concepts of holy and profane, of, of what is accepted and unaccepted, of natural and unnatural. You have that in the Pearl Poet uh, almost constantly. Uh, you have the center and the margins, and the center is the dominant center, and the margins constantly impinging on that center. Um, and all these come in a series of seemingly so-called unnatural reversals, where the one is actually exchanged with the other, and it creates a sense of chaos. But ultimately, uh, it culminates in a promise of salvation. Now, what do I mean by all of these things? Um, um, I believe that these texts uh, we're actually trying to show through these reversals uh, the instability of the previously conceived notion of stable boundaries of dogmatic knowledge. Uh, what, we, what used to be perceived as orthodox or completely um, uh, canon is no longer that. I mean, all of a sudden you have notions and ideas that might impinge on that canon, that might impinge on, on orthodoxy and, and um, show you that an idea may be interchangeable and what seemed to be orthodox may not completely be orthodox and vice versa. So um, uh, that's one aspect. Another important aspect that I think uh, these reversals are trying to show is that um, this is um, a Gnosticism kind of answer uh, to the search for this Gnostic truth and wisdom that is not necessarily uh, a comfortable or stable one. It's a struggle for the passer, uh, for the person seeking that Gnosis, um, seeking or for whom Gnosis is, is uh, sought, rather. He's not uh, actively seeking it. He's not supposed to be actively seeking it. Um, so this is emphasized through the recurring uh, poetic reversals uh, that I discuss at length in the book and the tensions presented, uh, presented in the poems themselves. And ultimately, this is showcased by the failed attempts, I think, or what I claim to be failed attempts at passing uh, presented in the first and second chapters of the book. But eventually, I do show a third attempt at passing that is actually successful in the third chapter, uh, where you have um, um, a knowledgeable character by the end. Yeah. So uh, let's get specific, uh, a little bit more specific with, with the works that you discuss in your in your book. And of course, they're not maybe, you know, pop culture uh, texts that everybody knows. But at the same time, th these are pretty well known texts. If you took some some English courses in university, even upper level English courses in, in a good high school, you know, you would have you would have been introduced, tackled, to discuss these texts. But before we, we get a little bit more specific, you mentioned dream visions and dream visions being very popular at this time in, in different works. It, uh, what, what does dream visions have to do with the specific texts that you discuss? And, and what do these visions have to do with Gnosticism? Okay, well, dream visions, um, as I will discuss in a second, um, was a very, the dream vision was a very popular genre in the late Middle Ages. And as uh, you can see, all of these works that I chose to discuss are actually forms of dream vision. 
Um, and uh, as you as you said, uh, these are very popular works of literature in that period. Uh, but there are there are actually much more popular works of literature than the ones I chose, uh, like Chaucer, like Geoffrey Chaucer's The Canterbury Tales, and uh, you know there are um, much more famous ones than the ones I chose. Um, but I chose these specifically precisely because of their uh, popularity on the one hand, but also because of their seeming religiosity, because of their seeming orthodoxy, uh, because they've been explored up to this point as orthodox, as traditional. And um, it was actually very important for me to show that even in this, these so-called exceedingly orthodox texts, uh, there are agnostic residues, uh, as you can very well see um, in, in my reading of the text. But back to the topic of hand, at hand, you asked about the dream visions. And um, like I said, in order to have a successful passing, um, um, a liminal space of in-between is required. Um, and that is exactly the point where the dream vision comes in. Um, uh, this uh, scholar named uh, Barbara Newman claims that dreams of this kind are like waking visions. Focus, they focus less on predicting the future, like a, unlike a vision, uh, than on achieving self-knowledge, entering vividly into past events or manifesting eternal truths. Mm -hmm. um, and the structure of such visionary texts can usually be outlined, she claims, in full movements. Uh, which is actually very, very uh, suitable for our texts because this is exactly what happens in all of them. Uh, first, you have a narrator describing an experience uh, he suggests, uh, that suggests the initial psychological state of the character. Second, you have the narrator recounting a new experience detailing a chain state of consciousness uh, during which he encounters other characters. Um, then the narrator describes an exchange. In this case, we have a dialogue between the narrator and these other characters. And finally, um, the narrator describes the aftermath of this exchange. So this is the basic dream vision um, uh, format. Now, the process of what I call a regaining of gnosis is a gradual process. Uh, according to Elaine Pagels, who I'm sure you've heard of, uh, very famous for Agnostic uh, Gospels book. Um, she claims that many Gnostics, like many artists, search for interior self-knowledge as the key to understanding universal truths. And this, I believe, is the internal process of work within my chosen literary texts. Um, I identify this, uh, this kind of developmental progression and examine the way such a character engages in this solitary, difficult process as they struggle against internal resistance. And the Gnostics characterize this resistance to Gnosis as the desire to sleep, which is very important, or to be drunk. That is to remain unconscious. So you're awake, but not quite. So it's an ironic waking into, uh, awakening into consciousness, reawakening, a kind of a reawakening that is happening. Um, the moment, um, um, then according to what I claim, the moment of Gnostic passing materializes in a moment of in-between, in-between physical wakefulness and sleep, which again is perfect for the dream vision, between activity and passivity, between reality and the dream vision, east and west, and ultimately in between ignorance and knowledge. As you can see, this is very reminiscent of all those reversals I spoke of before. Um, so this is a central concept uh, that I keep dealing with um, in, in the book, in all of the texts. Um, these are binaries that are dependent on each other for their meaning and their very existence. One cannot exist without the other. Um, and the scene, the scene, the Gnostic passing, becomes the portal where the opportunity of regaining Gnosis finally presents itself. Um, Gnosticism is, is well known for these sort of divine female figures that are associated with wisdom, with awakening. Do we find such figures in these texts? Oh, definitely. <laughs> in the Pearl Poets' works, we have the Pearl Maiden, who is the key figure. 
uh, we have in the second poem, we have Dame Patience. And in the third poem, we have Dame Cleanness. Um, and uh, they're all very wise, feminine figures uh, trying to lead uh, whichever character towards gnosis, uh, towards knowledge uh, and self-awareness and so on. Um, in Pierce Plowman, we have the feminine truth with a capital T and we have Holy Church. Uh, in the Confessio Amantis, uh, we have Venus, uh, who is a very important figure. So the female voice possesses a privileged place in between this world and the next, the body and the soul, activity, passivity, again with these reversals, uh, and finally, epistemologically superior, yet capable of passing from one level to another. Um, yeah. Um, okay, so we can, uh, we'll get even a little bit more specific, but can you tell us, I mean, I guess, tell us all about, but tell us the plots of the Pearl Poets' works, and what are some of the, the uh, major Gnostic ideas and themes that, that you see there? Okay, well, in very, very general terms, I try to summarize as much as possible. Um, on a literal level, um, as the poem has been interpreted and read, read many times uh, in the past, Pearl was basically accepted as an elegiac poem depicting a father's loss of his daughter, uh, whom he equates with an unblemished pearl. Now, um, this interpretation was very soon overrun by scholars who argued for an allegorical reading, uh, somewhat more in-depth reading, which focused on the symbolism of the pearl maiden. Now, my reading focuses on the implications of this relationship between the dreamer and the pearl maiden in its structure and style. Um, and in this poem, the referred to roles are between father and daughter, as perceived by both church and society. Now, what do I mean by that? The moment I examine emphasize it what could be considered in 14th century religious outlook, a heretical turning point where the daughter actually becomes a possessor of otherworldly knowledge and the intended guide of and the intended guide of the ignorant disadvantaged father. Um, intriguingly, this specific reference actually brings to mind a 7th century Syriac Gnostic poem titled The Song of the Pearl, um, which appears in the Acts of Thomas and I discuss at length. Uh, the Gnostic poem's symbolism and creative liberty, its particular emphasis of the soul journey, and finally its spiritual message of personal intuitive reawakening and enlightenment helped flesh out the many inexplicable anomalies of Pearl um, in, my, in the poem that I uh, explore. So one of the Gnostic poem's alternative titles is actually the Hymn of the Soul. So you again have an interchanging idea notion of Pearl and Soul, um, which suggests an analogy between the Pearl and the Soul, as I said. Uh, now in the poem itself, the prince laments, and this I quote, I forgot that I was a king's son and became a slave to their king. I forgot all concerning the pearl for which my parents had sent me." So that's very interesting um, because in the end of the Gnostic uh, Song of the Pearl, the prince becomes a self. He becomes a first with a capital F, an individual, whereas by the end of Pearl, the jeweler, the father, never becomes a self. He falls back onto what we call safe, familiar act activity by ironically awakening into a conscious, into a continuous state of slumber. So um, in Patience, uh, the, uh, is actually the second poem uh, by the Pearl Poet, um, right dab in the middle, um, where the poet takes another step forward, again, breaking from traditional boundaries. Um, here specifically in the relationship between God, uh, God and humanity, um, while maintaining this didactic structure reminiscent of Pearl. Um, and uh, Patience seems to take the already established structure that was depicted in Pearl and adds another dimension to it, um, later taken up by Cleanus, the third poem, um, as well. And uh, what happens is he basically sets up a theme uh, and then provides a seemingly appropriate biblical exemplum that would help elucidate the theme. So uh, here what we have is, uh, is what is called in uh, literary terms is a frame narrative, which the main theme and the protagonist are, of course, patience. 
Um, and then in the embedded narrative, we have a description of the relationship between Jonah and the figure of God. Uh, this is the particular uh, biblical exemplum that uh, he chose uh, to deal with. Um, and patience becomes the place within repose, which enables the hearer to become receptive of the revelatory message and veer away from the state of misguided intoxication and regain gnosis. So like the dream, vision, and pearl, the poem itself provides the place of knowledge. Um, but again, much like in Pearl, which was an unsuccessful attempt at gaining gnosis, regaining gnosis, uh, patience also ends on the same note. There is a sense of of movement forward, but not quite there yet. Um, so in cleanness, uh, which by the way, many scholars have claimed seems completely unconnected to the rest of the poems um, and uh, uh, very weirdly and strangely so is, is part of this uh, trilogy, as I call them, of poems. But as I show in the book, it's actually very much connected. And uh, the third in a line of, of development uh, towards something. Now, what that something is, I claim it to be that pursuit of Gnosis. But yet again, it is not achieved in this poem either. Um, so um, I would say that Cleanus again, seems to pick up where patience leaves off. And uh, it takes on the same thematic uh, line um, with a reversal, actually, of cleanness versus filth and vicariously the discussion of the body versus the soul, uh, which uh, is very central to this poem. And uh, it's also circular, which is uh, very interesting. I discussed the idea of, of uh, circular structure in the book as well, um, because the poem begins and ends with a feast, uh, but they're reversals, they're two sides of the same coin. We have in the first part, we have the celebration of the Eucharist, uh, depicting a traditional outlook on the treatment of a, of a poorly dressed, physically unclean guest, uh, while the ending scene actually portrays a reversed version of the Holy Mass, which is a black mass. And this parodies the traditional concept, showcasing the absurdity of people's reactions and their lack of understanding. Um, and this scheme of reversals that was uh, that started in Pearl seems to reach a peak in cleanness. Uh, the foul wedding guest is depicted much the same as Jonah once he was expelled from the beast. Uh, he's foul, but obviously possesses the potential of attaining Gnosis, since otherwise his presence at the feast cannot be explained. I mean, why? what is he doing there? Why is he there otherwise, right? Um, so his presence, in a way, serves as a materialization of the Gnostic potential of his character. In the middle, we have another biblical exemplum of Sodom and Gomorrah. Now, that's an interesting choice. And um, I, co I quote in my book from the Gospel of the Egyptians, which is another Gnostic gospel, a Gnostic text, wonderful text. This is a slightly longer quote, so bear with me. Um, <clears throat> there came forth from that place the great power of the great light, Placithia, the mother of the angels, the mother of the lights, the glorious mother, the virgin with the four breasts bringing the fruit from Gomorrah is spring, and Sodom, which is the fruit of the spring of Gomorrah, which is in her. She came forth through the great Seth. Some say that Sodom is the place of pasture of the great Seth, which is Gomorrah, but others say that the great Seth took his plant out of Gomorrah and planted it in the second place to which he gave the name Sodom. For she gave birth through the word to truth and justice, the origin of the seed of the eternal life, which is with those who will persevere because of the knowledge of their emanation. This is the great incorruptible race which has come forth through three worlds to the world. And grace will be with those who belong to the race through the prophets and the guardians and the guardians who guard the life of the race. Because of this race, famines will occur and plagues. But these things will happen because of the great incorruptible race, because of this race, temptations will come, a falsehood of false prophets. Then the great Seth saw the activity of the devil and his many guises and his schemes, which will come upon his incorruptible, immovable race and the persecutions of his powers and his angels and their error that they acted against themselves. Now, what does all this mean? Uh, this mean? 
So this excerpt actually claims that the devil's works will bring much adversity and disaster upon the world, but the blame will be laid upon Seth's incorruptible race. But the foolishness of the orthodox followers of the unchosen ones will simply perpetuate the error, making them unable to see that they were ultimately acting against themselves. Mm -hmm. So, um, yeah. <laughs> yeah. Um, a very no. Oh, sorry. Go ahead. <laughs> I'm sorry. A very potent uh, um, quote. Yeah. <laughs> so, um, moving on to to the next work, uh, you you actually mentioned that uh, you discovered the Gnostic paradigm through through work on on the Piers Plowman tradition on on the character of Piers Plowman, right? Right. So, so th this is this is the same character there's a bunch of different works that star this character by different people and they kind of share influences um is, am i right on that 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 you know the pierce plowman is, is he sort of like a, a stock character in, in some yes. of the literature of the time but but yes. scholars have actually seen heresy in in a variety of pierce plowman works so can you tell right. us a little bit about this character these works their interconnectedness these heresies right um it has been discussed at length <laughs> uh the many different versions of this stock character, which is an exact term uh, for this character. I actually used uh, the more traditional version, the gold standard of, of Pierce Plowman uh, by so-called William Langland, uh, which also has different versions, uh, but I used one that kind of combines all three of them and, and uh, plows, um, that's a play on words, Pierce Plowman um, <laughs> plows through <laughs> um, uh, this this chaotic soul journey um, that he seems to undergo um, um, in in this tale uh, in this poem. Um, so yes, people scholars have, have discussed it across genres and and across themes and ideas. Have claimed that. It has social and political overtones, and um, some have claimed that the poem has somewhat uh, a reformist outlook, uh, where Langland was actually considered a Wycliffe supporter, and the poem uh, was uh, perceived as a political tool of reformative propaganda. Um, uh, we can uh, we also have to uh, uh, pay attention and and mention the 1381 peasants revolt, uh, which is another very famous uh, moment in history that many people claim uh, led to the writing of Pierce Plowman. Um, so it's a very chaotic period. And the poem itself, the version uh, that I chose to discuss um, and to explore actually shows that. It is very chaotic, very uh, jumbled uh, uh, ideas and notions here. And nobody is sure which is which and what is what. And again, you have this this uh, system of reversals coming up over and over again. And um, um, in, in my exploration in particular, I think it is imperative to consider this uh, reformist tradition, um, even though nowadays it's, it's kind of uh, dismissed, somewhat dismissed, um, as a point of reference to the emergence of the Gnostic residue, uh, because I'm making a kind of parallel to the emergence of Lollardy, which is another heresy of the time, um, um, which again was interesting to intellectuals of the time as a new way to be pure without depending on clerics, which was wonderful for them, right? Uh, because it was all about a personal quest for perfection and salvation. And supposedly this is what Piers Plowman is about. So indeed, there is a crisis of faith in the late medieval period and some critics have argued that Pierce Plowman depicts an inward journey on the backdrop of this set crisis in an attempt to find answers through penitential and redemptive suffering. However, while these scholars have emphasized the poem's place within Orthodox tradition and materials, I think the true emphasis and focus in the poem actually lies not just in faith, but the search for a certain knowledge that is independent of and surpasses faith. And this is actually the very definition of Gnosis. 
So can you uh, take us through some of the, the major Gnostic ideas and themes that, that you see? I mean, you already mentioned a few, but uh, <laughs> you can go more in depth with, with some of the Gnostic ideas and themes that you, you see in the Langland Piers work or the, the version of the Langland Piers work that uh, you use in your book. Well, again, it's this notion of reversals, um, which everything where you have everything is misplaced, so to speak. Uh, what seems to be the, uh, to be orthodox and traditional is actually quite the opposite, and vice versa. So you see this uh, repetitive um, um, metaphor, this repetitive uh, form of 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 uh, the soul journey of of placing um, um, opposites against each other and using these opposites, using these binaries, in order to understand oneself ironically enough so you need these opposites you need these reversals in order to reach some kind of understanding in order to reach some kind of knowledge and what pierce is actually doing um or is supposed to be doing um he is uh going on this soul journey um which later on i i show um uh, much more at length um uh, in, in the Confessio Amantis, in John Gower's Confessio Amantis, but uh, this is also a soul journey in which Pierce is kind of like a guiding slash guided figure um, that he's trying to rally everybody around him and awaken everybody out of their stupor, out of their sleep and say, you know, people wake up, we need to do something, something needs to change because the situation is not great. So it all of this common it eventually doesn't actually manage to rally anybody up, uh, but uh, he, he he tries to to do that, and at the end there is this messy chaotic scene in which you don't actually understand what is going on, and I think this is the uh, the text's um, uh, way of trying to show that there was an attempt here to gain something, to reach some kind of state of knowledge, to reach some kind of state of difference, of change, but that attempt fails for no apparent reason. Nobody really knows why. <laughs> yeah. But, but uh, it, yeah. I was just going to say, I think this really emphasizes the importance of the Gnostic paradigm as, as a hermeneutic tool, right? Because without it, yes. what's going on at the ending? It doesn't make any sense. Or exactly. going back to the Pearl poet, well, why does... Why does uh, why does the last poem, why does cleanliness, it's cleanliness, right? The not yes. seem to fit with the other ones, right? Exactly. All with the other two fit so well exactly. together. So when exactly. we have this hermeneutic tool, it's like, oh, wow, these these mysteries that people have been arguing about in these texts for, you know, exactly. hundreds and hundreds of years now are, are suddenly illuminating. Right. Right. Everything falls into place. Uh, the Gnostic paradigm sets up this developmental um, uh, scale, I would call it, uh, that is both a scale and a circle because eventually it reaches full circle. So you have many different attempts at gaining and regaining said Gnosis, but at the end, what you get is poetic closure and you do get a successful attempt when everything comes to fruition and we have the Eureka moment, we have uh, um, uh, the revelation, so to speak. So that happens in the Confessio Mantis. Yeah, well, let's talk about that now. Again, where do you see Gnosticism in it? And in contrast to the other works, like why is this one an example of a successful passing where perhaps the other ones mm -hmm. are examples of attempted passing that don't, that don't quite work? Right. So much like the other texts, uh, the Confessio Amantis, uh, which literally translates to the lover's confession, um, emphasize the role of, uh, um, emphasizes the role of the female guide in this process of passing along with the, impor with the importance of passivity in an exercise, basically, of storytelling of ethical parables, that's what the Confessio is all about, set in dream vision tradition. And by the way, uh, Pierce Plowen was also basically a dream vision. So as you can see, all of them are dream visions. Um, and uh, this, this liminal space of in-between, um, a very interesting uh, uh, point, uh, because I, I actually uh, make this point in the book as well, um, that the Gnostics, as far as anyone could tell, uh, used to meet up 
in liminal spaces, in spaces of in between, uh, because uh, secrecy was uh, was very important, obviously. So um, on the surface, the scheme of the Confessio seems fairly simple, because it presents basically it presents numerous tales inspired by different traditions, written by many different poets and artists, on the backdrop of the seven deadly sins. Uh, he divides the books, uh, the book into uh, eight books based on the seven deadly sins with an eighth book uh, that is very interesting in and of itself. Um, and uh, the emphasis seems to be on some mode of love or more particularly lust. So we have issues of the body here. Um, scholars have claimed that much like Pierce Plowman, this is a work of social political motivation in which a glorified past is meant to be emphasized on the backdrop of a problematic present. Now, I claim that the scope of the Confessio is not necessarily socially oriented, but rather a specifically individual endeavor for salvation in a kind of mystical progress of the soul. So in this manner, social change may become possible through personal and individual reflection. So you have to have that personal journey first in order to attain social redemption. Um, so how can you attain individual reflection? How can you attain um, that, uh, how can you achieve that personal journey? Uh, it can be attained through a reawakening of the self via, again, the regaining of domain knowledge, i.e. Gnosis, uh, that is Gnosis. And here we have the, the figure, the character of love, Venus, um, the embodiment of love, and her chaplain genius play here the role truth with a capital T played in Pierce. So in other words, the purpose of genius, who is love's messenger, is to instruct Amans, who is the, uh, the protagonist, the main character, quite literally, a man uh, who is also a lover, um, in his lost art and save him because he is a lover that has lost himself. He is a lover without love, a subject without a self, if you will. So um, what I think is interesting and what I think actually um, presents this successful passing is the ending. Uh, in the ending, the Confessio ends with a monologue. Now, a monologue uh, in, in literary terms is a personalized narrative that serves as the literary mirror of self-awareness that symbolizes the inner quest Amans has undertaken. And it is this introspection that eventually leads to an epiphanic moment of revelation that culminates in a successful passing, which is exactly the passing of the spirit into knowledge and a spiritual, a spiritual salvation and finally giving us that poetic closure that we so uh, dreamt of and wished for. Yeah. Sorry, a, a question I didn't send to you before, but I, I think you'll be able to easily handle it. And it's one of my famous <laughs> leading questions. But we uh, we spend a lot of time on the show talking about Gnostic ascent, right? So many of the ancient Gnostic groups had an idea, you can interpret it literally or sim uh, symbolically, uh, of, of an ascent to the soul. You have to get past you know seven sinful archons that mm -hmm. are symbolized by the planets. Mm -hmm. So you mentioned sort of an ascent through 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 seven sins in this book, ending up in, right. a, in a place of the eighth. So do you see a connection here with this, this Gnostic ascent? Oh, most definitely. And I actually refer to this, uh, to this ascent in the book. Uh, and uh, you can most clearly see it in the Confessio Amantis because it is a play on the seven deadly sins. Um, uh, and uh, you, you actually have a very similar thing in Pierce Plowman as well. Uh, where you have a parade of the seven deadly sins. Uh, and this is a, an integral part of the soul journey of the character that he needs to overcome, that he needs to pass in order to reach um, salvation, in order to reach that, um, um, uh, that moment of that epiphanic moment of revelation, that regaining of Gnosis. Um, so yes, I, I definitely uh, parallel, make a parallel, uh, draw a parallel between these two notions of the soul drama, of the soul journey, um, going through the levels, um, and and um, uh, the ones that you see 
in the literary text um, uh, in their encounter of the seven deadly sins, which is very interestingly a very specific orthodox notion. I mean, the, the Orthodox Church uh, enjoyed very much the teachings of the seven deadly sins uh, and, and uh, spreading the fear of the seven deadly sins. Um, and uh, through that, trying to, uh, to push anybody who uh, might dare um, uh, veer away from the traditional back home, back to, uh, to the cradle of, of faith, so to speak. So yes, I can definitely see uh, the parallel in that. <laughs> now, unfortunately, we we do have to wrap up, though. This, this has been a, a really fascinating uh, discussion. Uh, but before we go, do you think Gnosticism could be found in other medieval works? Uh, do you think that the Gnostic paradigm is something that, that other scholars who, who study this time and this material could be exploring to, to understand these works better? I will be very concise, most definitely. <laughs> <laughs> I concur. <laughs> um, well, I mean, that that's a good place to leave it right there. So I, I have been throwing up your book onto the, the screen uh, with the Amazon link. So everybody go out and buy The Gnostic Paradigm. I, I know it is an academic book. The hardcover is quite expensive. You know, folks, in that case, uh, you can request books at your local library, often on their website. You can uh, write in, you know, what books they should buy. So, you know, if, if you don't have the scratch, you know, definitely suggest that your library buy this because uh, if you're interested in Gnosticism, though it is a scholarly work, of course, uh, I, I think you're going to uh, uh, you're going to love it, um, and uh, yeah, I, I hope you do some some more work in this field. Um, I, I know that uh, that academia is particularly messed up at the moment, and there's there's not a lot of, <laughs> of probably interest in Gnostic study of medieval works. But uh, uh, right. I, I hope that you are able to, to develop the thesis, do more works, and uh, write some more papers, and come back on the show. So um, <laughs> yeah, that thanks again. Thank you very much. It was definitely my pleasure. Thank you. Bye. Bye, everybody. <laughs> Bye.